İyi akşamlar, herkese merhaba. Bilim Akademisi Yılın Konferansı'na hoş geldiniz. Ben Bilim Akademisi Başkanı Canan Atılgan. E, bu akşam konuğumuz Alessandro Vespignani olacak. E, kendisini e, teşekkür ediyoruz kabul ettiği için e, davetimizi. E, kısacık bu yılın konferanslarının tarihçesinden bahsetmek istiyorum sizlere. E, 2016 senesinde biz ilk yılın konferansını yaptık. Üyemiz Ayşe Buran önerisi ve maddi desteğiyle çünkü pandemi yoktu ve pandemi olmadığı için işte konuklarımızı ağırlığımızla ilgili desteğiyle birlikte Justin Belburnell'in konuşmasıyla ilk yılı yaptık. İkinci yıl 2017'de konuğumuz Timothy Garton Ash'ti. 2018'de farklı bir formatta yaptık. Bir e, inovasyon konulu bir konferansımız oldu. Günter Stok ana konuşmacımızdı ve bir panel e, davet, e, devam ettik. 2019 yılında e, Feryal, Feryal Özel e, üyemiz aynı zamanda konuğumuz oldu. E, 20, 2020'de de Daran Hocam oldu. E, bu sefer Zoom üzerinden olan, mecburi durumdan dolayı olan... E, konferansımızda konuğumuz oldu. Bugün çok heyecanlıyız Alessandro Vespignani konuğumuz olduğu için. Soru cevapla ilgili bir iki noktaya değinmek istiyorum. Sorularınızı lütfen YouTube'dan da Zoom'dan da Q&A kısmına yazarsanız biz toplayacağız ve konuşmanın sonunda ileteceğiz konuşmacımıza. Kendinizi rahat hissettiğiniz dilde yazabilirsiniz. E, Türkçe veya İngilizce hangisinde rahat hissediyorsunuz. Tabii biz İngilizce çevirerek kendisine aktaracağız. Cevap e, İngilizce gelecek. E, ama takip edebildiğinizi umuyoruz konferansımızı. E, e, ve e, bu şekilde devam edeceğiz. Lütfen sorularınızı bizi <gülüyor> Bon sorularımıza da evet Alessandro Vespignani tanıtmak için üyemiz ve bu konferansta bu yılın konferansında bize çok destek olan Ayşe Erzan hocamıza bırakıyorum sözü. Teşekkür ederim Canan. Alessandro Vespignani bizi duyuyor musunuz? Evet. He's an extraordinary scientist. He has, in some sense, transformed how theoretical and empirical research can be conducted into systems or situations which are extremely complex, demanding not only expertise in their various aspects, but also in their integrated or, in some sense, emergent state. I would also like to congratulate not only his acuteness and judiciousness in making scientific decisions, but also humane ones, such as responding full force to the summons brought forth by the early signals of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to welcome him and thank him wholeheartedly for giving us uh, this opportunity to hear him at the annual seminar of Science Academy in Turkey. I met Alessandro in Rome in 1990, just as he was beginning his PhD work with Luciano Pietroneri. He drove us uh, with me and my husband from the airport to the Pasteur Institute where we were to stay. But not being satisfied with the setup there, the next day he arrived with beautifully embroidered sheets. <laughs> It looked very much like they were from his mother's <laughs> house. So, is that right? <laughs> His chivalrous hospitality yeah. is amazing. So Alessandro finished his PhD at uh, La Sapienza, University of Rome in 1993, and went on to Yale and to, uh, then to Leiden University for postdoctoral research, from where he moved to the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste for five years. He was interested in fractal growth, self-organized criticality, and sandpile models at this time. Uh, we have a joint fractal growth paper from this time together with Luciano P uh, Pietroneri. He was briefly in the University of Paris Sud before he moved to Indiana University in 2004. Since 2011, he's at Northeastern University as Sternberg Family Distinguished University Professor of Physics, Computer Science, and Health Sciences 
as well as being the director of the Network Science Institute. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, Network Science Society, and a member of Academia Europea. His most recent recognition has come from the Italian government. He was knighted with the Order of the Star of Italy for his very early recognition of the coming pandemic and energetic response in starting up international collaboration between researchers in the two continents to which he belongs. His involvement with uh, complex scale-free networks fittingly starts at the turn of the century, uh, E2000. In fact, that's the turn of the millennium. The, math <laughs> the mathematical as well as the computational understanding of complex networks meant the study of interacting entities from genes to human beings to the nodes of an internet. Alessandro spearheaded the study of the spreading and dynamics of epidemics on networks, as well as the properties and behavior of biological, social, and technological networks. His most cited is 6,300 something papers uh, with Romualdo Pastor Satoras, Epidemic Spreading in Scale-Free Networks and uh, Epidemic Dynamics and Endemic States in Complex Networks, both published in 2001, have started a whole new field. With Pastor Satoras, they also published two books, Evolution and Structure of the Internet, and with Alain Barra and uh, Marc Barthélemy, the monograph Dynamical Processes on Complex Networks. Alessandro Vespignani has not only expanded our theoretical understanding, but has tackled many crucially important practical problems using statistical and computational tools from many different disciplines. Alessandro visited Istanbul several times. Once in 2006, Istanbul was snowbound and only with a handful of hardy colleagues like Alkan Kabastolu, <laughs> Muhit de Mungal, and my student no. Duygu Banja, <laughs> we made it to the Turkish <laughs> Academy of Sciences, where we heard Alessandro's lecture on the SARS epidemic, predictability and epidemic pathways in global outbreaks of infectious diseases, the SARS case study. That's the title of uh, the um, uh, paper which was finally uh, uh, which appeared in 2007. The same year, he lectured at a meeting we organized in Bukada on complex systems. When uh, Duygu uh, Baljan, my student, got her degree in 2007, she went to work with Alessandro in Indiana, Indiana University Center for Complex Networks and Systems Research. And from 2011 on at the Institute for Scientific Interchange, the ISI Foundation in Turin. In 2009, they published together with other colleagues, multi-scale mobility networks and the special spreading of infe infectious diseases. This Dui Gobaljam with the first author and uh, a whole number of other people. Uh, this, this appeared in 2009. Duygu came back to uh, ITU in 2012, and unfortunately, she died in a car accident the next year. Uh, this uh, was a blow, I, I know, both to me and to Alessandro. Alessandro has, uh, with his organizational skills, as well as uh, scientific acumen, also infused somehow the scientific milieu with a new energy. I would like to thank Alessandro Vespignani for sharing this evening with us and wish that the night has many more triumphant battles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keisha. So that, that's, uh, that was the kindest introduction I could think of. So <clears throat> I... Um, I first of all, I my deepest regret is that I cannot be with you in person. This is something that is really 
We'll manage. Yeah. Uh, I, as Aisha was was was mentioning, I, I visited many times uh, Istanbul or Turkey. is is is a country I really deeply deeply love, and I'm, I'm so sorry that that can happen in person yet. Uh, hope there would be other occasions. Uh, the second thing is really Aisha. Thank you very much from the bottom of my art for, for, for your introduction. It was so kind and also remembering, you know, the, the, the old, uh, the, the, our first meeting in, uh, in Rome uh, when I was really just a, a young student and Aisha has been always a, a source of inspiration and a role model for me. So it's really important to, uh, uh, to remember that. I, I will, Tell you a little bit what what I, I obviously this video why science uh, is uh, what what is the research what is you know try to disentangle a little bit the the, the, the operational versus the the more foundational part although there would be a lot of things applied uh, to. Uh, that they will show that have uh, been applied in the in the past uh, couple of years, and also I try to give you a flavor of why a physicist or a computer scientist might be involved uh, into into into uh, computational epidemiology and something like the response of uh, to a pandemic. I'm also apologize for my tone of voice. Unfortunately, I, I I'm sick, not COVID, but uh, <laughs> you know. The winter is uh, is hitting now. Um, I will uh, share my screen. If uh, let's uh, see if that uh, uh, that works. I think uh, I would appreciate if you could confirm that uh, you see my my my slides. Thank you. And um, uh, also, as a as a matter of uh, of uh, timing, uh, what what what is my allotted time at this point after all the introduction so that I don't uh, get too much uh, on, on, on, on what, what I can, I have another, let's say 40 minutes uh, roughly. Good. So um, first of all, let me immediately say that what I will show is not uh, something that uh, is, can be thought to, to, to be done by a single person or scientist. This is a very large scale collabora collaboration and effort that involves people at my institution as well as people across the world from from United States uh, to, to, to Europe and uh, uh, foundations and uh, even uh, even the, the, the some data providers and, and, and really uh, it, it's important to stress how much uh, is important to have international collaborations in a situation like like the the the the the, the, the, the pandemic we are uh, navigating uh, uh, through at the moment. I, I I tend to use more the word the storm at this point than, than pandemic. After two years, it seems an endless storm, but uh, it's. Uh, uh, we need to be really all together, and unfortunately, what we have seen. Uh, recently it's the opposite there's a lot of polarizations a lot of uh, uh, un, not how to say uncoordination so not coordination across countries and and a lot of division that actually are not helping at all what is the response the global response to this pandemic also i want to dedicate this talk to the memory of duigu uh, as uh, aisha was saying she has been working with me when we did start uh, our activities in, uh, in computational epidemiology with an application on, <clears throat> on biological viruses. And really she was the first author of many of the crucial papers that have put the pillars of the methodologies that I, I, I, I, I will show uh, to you uh, later on. And so I, it's really, I, you can't imagine how much I, I, I, I miss her and I feel really, uh, how much the world has lost in terms of uh, uh, of an exceptional person and, and, and scientist. Uh, a little bit about my team, just to tell you that my team, as Aisha was mentioning, is uh, is made by 
by physicists, but is made also by computer scientists, by economists, social scientists, biologists, biostatisticians. It's uh, uh, the response that we have to a problem as complex as a pandemic you can't uh, ignore any one of those dimensions that goes from the way people behave to the microscopic properties of the virus to the fact that you have to run millions of simulations and you can't wait a month for those results and you need to integrate a large amount of different different data. So my team has been working in this area for about uh, close to 20 years at this point and we have supported the, the, the development of specific tools for the spreading for the uh, analysis of uh, the global spreading of emerging infectious diseases we have been collaborating with most of the institution working in the area the center for disease control but also the who the the european center for disease control and many many other institutions and since uh, COVID-19 started in January, we did uh, try to offer our, our support to, to pandemic response. As always, I want to start to say that, you know, who is really fighting uh, uh, the battle is the people in the front lines, the, the nurses, the doctors, uh, the, the, the, the, the, all the people who are really uh, risking their lives every day. What we're trying to do is to provide some intelligence to help the response to administer and to prepare for, for, for to administer mitigation measures to, to plan for what, what, what could happen in the future. Well, where all that start uh, is uh, from the fact that we, in the last 20 years, and uh, Aisha was mentioning uh, the turning of the, the millennium, so that makes feel how much I'm old at this point, you know, <laughs> we change the, the, the, the you know, the 1000 uh, years, well, uh, but really there, there has been an incredible acceleration in the last 20 years. And so data that were not even, uh, we were not even thinking about 10 years ago or five years ago are now available. And I'm talking about, first of all, all the data that we get on biology or the fact that we can do gene sequencing and that is so important these days. For instance, I'm sure you are aware of the Omicron uh, variant of concern that is spreading in these days. Well, you can identify and talk about that because you know you have gene sequencing because you can do phylogenetic analysis of viruses in real time. Uh, but as well, you know, there is more knowledge on network biological networks. We have mobility. We have, we can gather data on where we go, how we meet, our contact patterns, our international travels, and then a huge amount of data that we can gather now on, on really on the society, social demographic characterization of populations, which are very unprecedented and now go down to the resolution of one by one kilometers. It's, it's really a huge amount of data. And there is much more, there is all the things, that, you know, for the first times in, in, in I think in the human history, we don't just have information about our physical whereabout, but also about what we think. We can read millions of messages posted on Twitter, on Facebook, and this provides you know, a huge amount of data on that behavioral uh, responses and thinking that are crucial to understand social economic phenomena. And a pandemic is one of those. Well, this is in the past years has led to the to to to, to a specific narrative that probably many of you have, uh, have uh, are familiar with. That is the big data narrative, you know. So at a certain point, even in two thousand nine, the, the editor of uh, of Wired uh, wrote uh, an editorial with the title "The End of Theory." So he was telling, well, you know, we will have so much data and we will be able to collect so much data that we can just throw them into a computer, use some artif smart artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm and get an answer. We don't need to understand really the phenomenon. We will get the answer from the machine. And he was closing the article saying, it's time that uh, science learn from Google. Well, that's, that was a very strong statement and science uh, scientists were not that happy about it. Uh, however, you know, you can go to, to, to, to do in those years and there was a very influential paper that was called 
that was using uh, basically Google searches to make prediction and uh, now casting and forecasting about the flu season in the United States. The idea was revolutionary and actually is a fantastic idea to say, well, generally the Center for Disease Control employs a sentinel of doctors that have to report the data, those data have to be analyzed statistically, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the, the, the, the level of prevalence in the United States uh, two weeks uh, uh, after the, the real time you're working in, you are always delayed. Well, you know, we have millions and millions of searches on Google. We can just sift through them and see what searches talk about flu, cough, uh, symptoms, et cetera. Then we put that in an appropriate uh, algorithms that is calibrated with the ground truth data from the Center for Disease Control. And actually we can get real time and then possibly also some forecast about what is the flu season. Well, that worked initially pretty well. But then there were a lot of a lot of issues, and uh, a lot of issues due to uh, to that point, to the theory, <laughs> to the fact that uh, you know, first of all, those algorithms which I don't just respect, but I use, and I you will see later. So machine learning is crucial now in many, many, many things. Lack uh, the microscopic understanding, the mechanistic understanding we need often to understand what's happening for a disease. So we don't wanna just have a number of the number of cases of a disease. We want to understand why a disease is growing, what are the causes, what is the reproductive number, what is the level of vaccination and how this is affecting what we see and so on and so forth. And so that is the first thing. So, so we need theory. Then we need to understand that data works with biases with incompleteness, with noise, with the fact that the digital platforms that we build are live platforms. So at a certain point, Google changed the way we search on it. It started to suggest what we search. And that introduced a huge bias that made, <laughs> it drove crazy the algorithm of, of, of uh, uh, to, to, to forecast flu. So, you know, there are all these things that we need to, to consider. The other things is that in disease, you know, and often artificial intelligence and machine learning works on an assumption. The more data you have to train the system and the better it is. Unfortunately, with diseases, that's not the case. With new pathogens is not the case. And also, if you use data of 10 years ago, even just 10 years ago, you are talking about a public health systems that is completely different from what is not now. And so you need, you know, you can't learn that much from the past. And so there is always a, a time window to use. And then there is some more reasonable, some more foundational issues that I really like to point out. They are in a paper by Eugenia Vulpiani in a journal that is called Philosophy and Technology. It really is a must read because basically it goes back to the Poincaré recurrence theorem in high dimensional system and why we can't, you know, we have to be very careful when we use machine learning to make uh, and artificial intelligence to make predictions and forecasts. Well, this is not to say that those ideas are not great. You know, Google flu trend has been dismissed now, but you know, it has learned and it was a great innovation that then has been improved. Why just use the the Google searches, we can use Twitter, we can use a, a, a restaurant reservation system that in the United States are very much used. And you see when you have cancellations, you know, the, the fraction of cancellation correlate with the flu season, the last minute cancellations and things like that. Then there are wearable devices, there are uh, hospital uh, uh, claims, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many things that you can aggregate together to get much better algorithms. And then, for sure, we learn that you know artificial intelligence and machine learning are great tools that we can use. And indeed, for instance, for short-term forecast, many of those algorithms are very powerful. They can detect patterns that are not due to the mechanistic evolution of, of, of, of the dynamics of a disease or a phenomena, but more to the biases in the reporting, in the signals, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see that, for instance, in the last 10 years where we, we've been working with the, with, the, with the influenza, you know, many of those algorithms now are really working very well. However, we need to keep into account also what happens when we have COVID, something like COVID-19. 
There are no training data early on. The reporting is changing, you know, because we all, all countries have, uh, how to say, uh, scrambled to improve testing, to define the disease, uh, uh, the case definition, etc. There are heterogeneous time lags. I will show you things like that. And then, you know, you can't learn too much on the past when you have uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the interventions that we use to mitigate the disease that are shutting down the world, you know, that changes completely the behavior of what we, we look. And so, you know, there are many, many things that we have to take into account. And this is why, you know, I, I think that really when we talk about how we approach uh, modeling, forecasting, and responding with intelligence to a pandemic, we need to think about actionable modeling. And actionable modeling means models that we can use to, act, to, to make action with new data. And those data can be big, small, and the approaches that we can use can be uh, machine learning, could be mechanistic, could be the models based on effective equations, but they need to be interpretable. We need to understand what we see and why. And we need to have control on initial condition, prediction limits. In a sense, we need to go from that time series that you see there to something that is like in modern weather forecast where you can understand the patterns of, of, of a hurricane and also understand what are the confidence interval of what you are, what you are forecasting, predicting, et cetera. There are also other nuances that I will try to mention later. Well, <clears throat> why diseases and why a person that is working uh, as a physicist uh, uh, might be interested in infectious diseases? Well, infectious diseases are a reaction diffusion process. <laughs> uh, like we do in physics, like we do in chemistry, you know, we are particles, we go in different places and we have interactions, reaction with other individuals. Those reactions are what, are the origin of the change of our state, where now the state is not a chemical uh, state or energy state or something like we will use in physics, but is our state with respect to the natural history of the disease. We can be susceptible, infectious, we can be hospitalized, we can be in the incubation stage and so on and so forth. Well, what is this network? of uh, this network where the reaction occurs? Well, these are urban areas can be, um, uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, can be uh, specific settings like the school, the workplace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And generally, we define those as a network uh, because we move from one setting to another, generally on time scale that are much shorter than the disease. And so, this is why we can really have this and can use network as a powerful conceptual and mathematical tool to describe how a disease uh, spread by using a reaction diffusion process on a network. Well, here you enter all the classical problems that we have gone through in other areas. Like for instance, the multi-scale problem, uh, it means that some processes are occurring on the scale of uh, one day or a couple of weeks, like when you travel internationally, and some, some uh, processes occurs on the time scale of, uh, uh, of a few hours, of half an hour, like when you drop your kids at school and, and commute to work. And so that's always, you know, requires to be smart, to, to integrate the degrees of freedom that are the very fast one with respect to the slow one. And then you enter the domains of why physics, why science, why engineering, why all those uh, uh, sciences can contribute to, to, to what we do in this area. Well. Here I give you an example of how our algorithms works. We generate a synthetic world. This synthetic world is made by layers where those layers are the population and the population is age structure as it contains information about, uh, uh, about the healthcare systems, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have another layer that is the commuting network. Those more rapid uh, uh, degrees of freedom that brings individual from one place to another within each of the of the subpopulations that we, we look at. And then you have the long, you know, how to say the long range connections of the international and domestic airlines uh, traffic in some countries is more by train or other other means, by other means, but you know that gives you a, a, a slower 
degrees of freedom. Generally, when you travel internationally, you don't travel one day to come back the day later, and so on and so forth. So these synthetic qualities where you know, we have people moving from one place of another, and then we have to use different modeling for the resolution of the disease process, of the reaction process. And they can be, you know, at this point, the tools that we have works at different scales. If you look at a global problem, you can use something that is more coarse grain in which individuals have a diffusion across these different subpopulations, but you have, of course, descriptions of them. You can introduce the age structure that is very different in different places. Or you can go down to age and base model, or you see the most sophisticated versions are those uh, uh, what we call multi layer networks, in which each layer is a specific uh, settings like the household, the workplace, the school, and really you map interaction among individuals. Well, computationally, you have to make choices because really you can't uh, simulate the entire world at the final scale. And so it's always a combination of those tools that opens a lot of foundational problems when you have to align different systems. And uh, I hope to have some time to, to, to, to, to, to, to, to give you a, a flavor of that. Well. This is a little bit how it works, the, the process. You start from real data. You use microsensors data that provides real information on thousands of households. And then you do a resampling of those data to create the macro population that respect the macroscopic data, like the age structure, the, the, the, the, the frequency of households of a certain kind, the, the, the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. So you create a synthetic population and you would say, well, you go through all this, uh, uh, how to say, this, this effort, why don't you use exact uh, right away census data or more capillary data that you can have from other data provider? Because you don't want to, here is where you want to have privacy preserving approaches. And so you don't want to work with a population that does the family name of people in a sense. You want to construct something that is statistically equivalent to the actual population, but is not you know, the exact population. This synthetic population creates a network of interaction in the different uh, places. And then you can decide the different level of description that you want to use. You can work at the fine level of the single network, or you can just use my scopic description in which you have a network of what is the probability that an individual of a given age will be in contact with the probability of another of a given age. And this is very important, for instance, for COVID, because you know that the, the, the, the profile of severity is so skewed over over the, the, the, the, the, the, the age of individuals that it's very important to consider that. On top of this synthetic population, you have the disease transmission. That it's a complex model that has to be informed from data that comes from, from the ground, from, from epidemiologists. So what is the latency time, the incubation time, what is the, the transmissibility, uh, the, the, the fraction of pre-symptomatic transmissions, uh, the fraction of people who are hospitalized or put in an intensive care unit, and so on and so forth. All that has to be integrated. And uh, uh, why it is important to, uh, uh, uh, to talk about networks? Because, you know, and, and here again, it's uh, as many of, uh, of the people in physics, chemistry, and other disciplines understand, network are a way to as a very powerful uh, uh, conceptualization that you see here. You have these households and then the individuals, uh, members of these households will, give, will go to places like schools, workplaces, etc. Well, what you do is to build the basically bipartite networks of people and settings. And then by doing the unipartite projections of those individuals, what you will get at the end is a network of contacts among the individuals over which you can uh, simulate and, uh, and model the spread of the disease. And each setting has a different interaction because the way we interact in the household is different of the way, uh, from the way we interact in the workplace or the school. And the other things that you can immediately see here, this was part of the dramatic choices that have been done in the past two years. The way we stop the disease is by cutting those links. And this is what we have done in the last two years. We have destroyed the fabric of the society by doing things that we were that were completely unprecedented, that we thought that were impossible even to think about it. And actually, now we see that you know uh, it's those 
the, the network doesn't even go back to normal right away. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, this gives you an idea of what is the, the, this invisible uh, uh, fabric of society that, that, that, that we live into. Well, we have a lot of multi, this is, can be boosted and, and brought on, on a much larger scale, like multi-layer networks, uh, uh, networks where the layers represent the settings or represents uh, individuals of a specific age. And each of those representations serves uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different purposes. In some cases, you want to optimize how you will distribute vaccines. In other cases, you want to optimize how you could uh, uh, limit interaction in specific settings because the transmissibility is very high in those places and so on and so forth. I Let me tell you, because at this point, generally everybody is, is asking me, well, talk about uh, forecast, what is happening tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, modeling is much more than forecast. And this is, again, is our understanding of what's going on. And the first thing is situational awareness. In many cases, I will give you examples. We don't know what exactly is going on. And models allows, and the theory allows you to get a glimpse of that. The other thing is to do intervention planning. Intervention planning is done through scenarios which are not forecast and structured reasoning, counterfactual experiments. And the other thing is that you can have epidemiological explanation. So there are really ways that you say, well, how much it is important, the pre-symptomatic transmission? Well, we know it is there, but it's really important. Well, model theory will allow you to access that information. Here, I give you a few examples of the work we did, but really, I don't want to personalize the response to COVID. There have been hundreds of uh, and thousands of researchers and every contribution is important. But for instance, we did experiment with counterfactual uh, analysis of what is the effect of eviction moratoria on transmission. You know, if you have people that are kicked out of their places, they, you know, you have an impact on the pandemic. And so you need to have arguments that say, well, we have an eviction on those, uh, we have a moratorium on those evictions. Well, you can do it through modeling. You cannot do the real experiment in this case. You know, you don't even have the time. You want to, to look at what is the effect of uh, poverty and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the effect of uh, lockdowns uh, on different uh, uh, areas of different wealth in a city. Well, you, can, you, you have to inspect this through modeling. And so you get information that otherwise would not be accessible and that will not guide, but will inform what is your response to a pandemic. Uh, well, the question is, well, can you tell us what, what, what really those approaches and science told us about uh, COVID-19, for instance, in 2020, because now we have even forgot about that. And I don't know if in your country there is uh, so much polarization as in, uh, in the US and Europe about uh, lockdowns, about closing, about uh, this is just a flu, you, we shouldn't do this, we should do that. Well, you know, and, and, and we have lost memory in many cases of what, what we went through. Well, science was telling a lot, and in many cases was an erd initially. For instance, situational awareness. In January 2020, we got news from, uh, from various sources of a typical pneumonia cluster of cases. And by mid-January, those cases were in, the, in a few tens, by January the 24th, in a few hundreds, and so on and so forth. Well. What was the real situation on the ground? Well, models and theory can tell you because instead of looking at what are the reporting from the origin places in a situation that obviously is completely plagued by the lack of tests, by the emergency, et cetera, et cetera, you can look, for instance, at the cases that are detected outside of that country. For instance, we knew that in mid-January, we had two cases detected in Thailand, then one case in Japan, and then so on and so forth. Well, if you, and I, I, I don't want to give you the technical details, but you can see exactly what is the, how to say, the backtracking calculation. If you know the cases detected, and you know how many people travel from the area affected by the disease, you can invert these mathematics in a sense and get what is a, a 
posterior distribution for the magnitude of the outbreak over there. So if I have to observe two cases in Thailand and one in Japan, how many cases I can expect to have there so that I have those at least three infected people traveling on, uh, with, uh, on, on connection with that amount of traffic? Well, right away, the, the modeling was telling us that there were thousands of cases in, in, in China. And that was helping to raise red flag. There was human to human transmission. The situation was completely different than what was seeming just by the reporting. And so you see, this is situational awareness. As soon then you start to get uh, uh, an understanding of the disease, you can start to do models and test, for instance, what is the importance of travel restrictions? Is travel restriction enough or not to stop, uh, to stop the disease? Well, this is something that is very controversial because you see what happens. That generally we do always a merry chase with respect to the virus. So, so initially we say, well, you see, most of the cases contributed internationally were coming from one. Then you do a travel ban on one, but you see that the, the epidemic has already spread in other places. And so the contribution comes, start to comes from other places. Then you do a travel ban to China, and then you what you get is that actually you realize that the epidemics was already at the level of diffusion with hundreds of cases in different places so that there were outbreaks not yet detected all over the world and cases were coming from different places. And so what is the issue here? The issue is that if we do not test enough and we do just travel ban uh, based on travel history, you know, on, on the fact that there is on ground community transmission, we are generally late. So we can delay because we have less importation, we have less outbreak that starts in the country of a few weeks, the onset of, of, of the epidemic, but we cannot stop. And so what is important is to say, well, we have to evaluate the trade-off. If we stop now the, the, the travels, et cetera, how much time we can buy and what we can do with the time that we bought at so much, uh, uh, uh, so much cost. And so this is, again, where modeling allows you to do a lot of, uh, a lot of insight, to get a lot of insight. For instance, this is work that was telling that the epidemics was spreading cryptically. What does it mean cryptic? It means that it was spreading, but we were not detecting the cases. In February, in most of the places around the world, you see that in Europe and United States, we were detecting a few tens of cases here and there, while actually we had thousands of transmissions per day. This is a disease with a lot of asymptomatic uh, uh, phenomenology with people who are pouchy symptomatic, so very little mild symptoms. Before you get the tip of the iceberg start to show up at the hospital, you need to have a consistent uh, uh, amount of infections that is in the large numbers. And so, you know, that is where, you know, in February there was that time, if you remember, where everybody was saying, okay, they are containing in China, we don't see anything in, in Europe, but we are fine. No, we were not fine at all. And we were telling, you know, agencies, look, to us, you know, things is spreading. It's just that since we don't have the testing capacity at that time, nobody had testing capacity on that scale, we are not detecting the cases. And by that time, indeed, if we look at these distributions, you see that we had local transmission. This is the probability, the posterior probability distribution of uh, having at least 10 cases per day. And you see that this distribution, it goes up and then it goes down because it means that you are over those 10 cases per day. In a sense, you know, you have a distribution that tells you that the medium value was uh, in some places uh, in uh, end of January, from mid to end of January, and in other places, uh, you know, that were with less international connection, et cetera, in early, in early March. Uh, this is United States, this is, uh, this is Europe. You see there was an heterogeneity, but basically what we had is that the epidemic was spreading much earlier than all than the, the, the containment measure and the fact that we started to see people showing up at the hospital. Uh, look at what happens when you study the, this network of introduction across the world. You see that uh, China indeed is just a small contribution that happens at the very beginning. 
And then the other contribution comes from places where there was no travel ban because we were not detecting the transmission. And even more interesting, you will see that most of the transmission, the introductions of the virus to states in the United States and Europe was domestic. So it was from within the United States and from within Europe. Now, I'm telling that because we, for instance, with Omicron, this is what we are seeing it again over and over. So what's happening at the moment, if somebody is telling you, oh, well, we don't see Omicron yet, we don't have transmission, this is not the case. Omicron is there, is, you know, they are finding where there is good sequencing and monitoring like UK, Denmark, and other places. But at this point, you know, that, that, that, that, that variant, unfortunately, is spreading in most of the places. Then what happens during the first wave and the second wave depends a lot on, on the measures and the mitigation measures that each government implemented. And so at this point, then you have to zoom and model each specific country. And I don't wanna get here into the details, but for instance, even the infection fatality rate, et cetera, is changing country by country, depending on what different approaches have been used and so on and so forth. Well, you will tell me what about Turkey and other countries? Well, we go there. The issue is that we have to be very uh, uh, careful because Turkey, you see again, it's, it's in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in early, early stage of, uh, of the disease uh, in, in of February. But what is important is to see that each of those countries had very different trajectory for the number of cases. Why? why we had different trajectories. This is because different countries implemented different uh, mitigation measures in each place. For instance, uh, uh, countries in the Far East, I'm talking about Japan, South Korea, et cetera, they had a very different approach to the, to the disease and to the way of doing contact tracing, et cetera. Uh, other countries received cases much later. And so, you know, their wave was delayed just because of the transportation and the connection to, to, to the world. And you see that every, every, uh, uh, every country at this point is a story by itself that we should really comment uh, and, and, and discuss in, in, in, in detail. Well, let me give you uh, some, some insight here. Uh, one is, uh, the difference between scenarios and forecasts. I will try now in the last few minutes to give, uh, to give some perspective on that. Uh, forecast is like for the weather forecast. You cannot have forecast for two months in advance. You can have forecast up to four weeks at the most. And that's because you need to work on current data and have information on what mitigation measure will be in place in the next few weeks, what is the behavior of the population, et cetera. If you want to go beyond that, you need to make assumptions, to make assumptions on what will be done and to make assumptions on what people and how people will behave. And these are assumptions. And so you can do those projections, but they, those are scenarios that you can use as a map and as a guide to the future, but will not be forecast. For sure, there will be no reality that is exactly like one scenario, okay? You can do an envelope more or less of what could happen according to different assumptions. And this is what has been one of the most difficult things to uh, communicate to the public in the, past, uh, in the past two years. Well, how you do that, uh, you do, uh, why you have all this uncertainty. The uncertainty is because the modeling assumptions, no model is perfect and has always assumptions. There are priors on all the parameters that you use in the models. Then there is the natural stochasticity of the phenomena. And so what you have is that you can run as you do for the weather forecast, thousands of trajectory. Then you can, how to say, constrain those trajectory to the evidence that you have from, from the reality. But generally, you know, there are many trajectory that are compatible with what you have in, in, in the reality. And at that point, you have a cone of uncertainty and you can aggregate all the realization that are viable and, and, and compatible with the reality. But generally you get always probability maps. You get something that is 
with a cone of uncertainty. And this is another thing that is very difficult to communicate. When you hear somebody that is telling about a single numbers, there would be 100 cases, 200 cases. This is not the way to communicate. There is always huge uncertainties. Well, the scenario that we were saying is even larger, that uncertainty. And uh, generally, those scenarios goes always from the worst to the best. But what is the worst? The worst is a scenario that we use as a benchmark that doesn't contain the mitigation. Why we use that scenarios? Because we want to know what is the benefit that each of the intervention that you take has on the ground. And so you need to compare with something where, you know, is your baseline. Okay, this is the worst possible things happening. First of all, it's also important as a risk assessment because for instance, during the pandemic, uh, the flu pandemic in H1N1 of, in 2009, no one did, sh did lockdowns or anything like that because even the worst case scenarios were not, you know, <laughs> leading to the collapse of the healthcare system. Well, that scenarios is just a benchmark. It's not, it's for sure the one that will not happen. Well, you know, communicating that to the media was is one of the most difficult things because everybody said jump on this worst case scenario to say it will be the end of the world. No, please watch out. What you have is then a portfolio of possible evolutions and futures that are based on, again, behavior and mitigations and po policy making. Well, then there are the forecasts. And the forecast is the most expensive things in terms of... Uh, numerical exercise is where computer science becomes extremely important because then you have to constantly update. It's like for the forecast, every week you have to redo everything. You have to bring new data, you have to bring new evidence, you have to bring new possible policy making in the next few days and so on and so forth. So it's a continuum cycle of, of, uh, uh, of computational effort that also needs to integrate real-time data, like, for instance, human mobility data. This is an example of what happened in the United States that we have done in collaboration with Cubic, that is a, is a, a location provider, uh, data basically from mobile devices, etc. And you see that, you know, from the baseline pre-pandemic, then there has been a very big dip because of all the lockdowns. And then, you know, the world slowly went back to normal, although we had the epidemic, you know. So, you know, the, the people behave and the, and, and the policy making behaves and you need those data in real time to make the forecast. But these are available for what is now. It's much more difficult to, to project, as we were saying, that one month or two months in advance. And so the forecasters, you see, you have all this data, this huge in sample data that you use to calibrate the model. And then you have this little box, which is your forecast at three to four weeks. And actually at four weeks already, you start to lose uh, coherence. So that is to say, again, if somebody is telling you what is going to happen in two months, it's like for the weather forecast. If somebody is telling you that in February there will be snow in Istanbul, it's not doing some, some scientific work, okay? So you can do something with numbers and confidence interval in the next two to three weeks. Then you get into scenarios and then it's for policy making. It's a different story. It's a complete different story. The other things is that we are try have been trying to communicate and that's again, the scientific process. Models are just models, are not oracles. And each model is not, is, is, can be wrong at a certain point. There is no optimal model with an optimal performance. There are always small differences. There are different assumptions. And we know that. This is the forecast for hurricane. Well, this is what is communicated. You know what is underlying this part? These, these are single models. And they are aggregated all together. You get what is called ensembling. Why? Because models 
have, you know, they might be very good certain time. And we are still trying to understand even in, in, in, in meteorology, why, you know, certain models are good in certain instances are less in others, depending on the data that they accumulate, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we do is that we need to use ensemble. And so generally you don't have to go around and ask a modeling group, what is your forecast or this other guy, what is your thinking? You need to have, inter, you know, centers, for response to pandemic, to diseases that leverage on many teams that can be in academia, it can be in the government, et cetera, that do this as a job and produce ensemble that provide response. We did try to do that here in the US by doing things uh, with tens of people. And then you see, these are papers with tens and, and uh, we have some for, for short-term forecast with hundreds of others, because then the effort has to be done in a collective way as a community and not as the single individual uh, scientist that uh, becomes uh, uh, suddenly an oracle. Well, this is, you see, you have all these different cures and at the end, what you get is a message. A message that should be communicated institutionally. Communication during this pandemic has been a nightmare. Really telling people what's happening and what does happen cannot rely on the single voices of researchers, but has to be, you know, like when there is an emergency with, with, with extreme weather, you know, there is the national weather forecast that says, you know, this is what we think is the best according to our knowledge. It might not be perfect, but for sure, you know, there is much less confusion and cacophony than if you have thousands of groups. Well, last minute, there are a lot of open challenges. I talk about many things that are operational, but this opens a lot of foundational scientific problems that I hope we will be able to, to, to, to to take all in the future. And this again, it's always my voice to, to government, to agencies. Now there is this urgency, but we don't have to work on a time cycle that is urgency. We need to prepare for the next time, do research for the next time. You don't get science ready whenever you want. You have to feed science. You have to nurture science so that it will be ready when it is needed. And so how do we construct those representative population? How we integrate heterogeneous data sets? How we, def the definition of the basic epidemiology is changing when you have those complex realities and emerging phenomena. Uh, how we model behavioral adaptation means to really revolutionize our, our approach to, to social sciences. The combination of machine learning and, and all the way that we have done modeling in other areas is a huge challenge and at the same time opens enormous opportunities. So in a sense, we have always to distinguish distinguish science between the war time and the peace time. And we really need to not forget the lessons that we are learning in these tough days. Thank you very much. I hope this will give you a glimpse of what we're doing and, and, and, and I'm really glad of, of this invitation. Thanks a lot. We thank you for this great talk. I have to say uh, that uh, we at Science Academy uh, throughout the pandemic, even from the very beginning, had this uh, approach of you know, communicating the scientific uh, dimensions in different ways. Uh, we have a popular science platform, which we call Sarkaj. It translates as pendulum. Um, so we had many um, short and long pieces there. We had a bunch of webinars, a bunch of um, um, conferences, workshops, and, um, and we, we collected people from top people in uh, medicine who told us about uh, you know, what's going on in the hospitals and how the treatments are being handled and how we, what we should predict about vaccines. But beyond that, we had social scientists, political scientists, economists. So we had all that and we had a big problem with data transparency in Turkey. It was really a nightmare. It has, it still is. Um, so thank you uh, because uh, although we had all these, you know, different uh, approaches and we did have uh, interdisciplinary uh, ways of looking at them in various um, uh, 
um, uh, platforms we used. I think your talk crowned um, how in a transdisciplinary science, we can bring um, people from all these different disciplines, um, but uh, in a multi-scale problem, that's definitely necessary. But also we need people who can speak the language of all these other people and kind of translate it to us. And you have done an excellent job of that. Thank you very much. Um, because this requires great degree of cooperativity and uh, it, it has been uh, a problem, uh, as I think. So, uh, and uh, one last thing, of course, I think it was like a lesson in scientific thinking, uh, scientific thinking process also, which is, I think this, we can take it and use it in 10 years and kind of still it will be relevant uh, in terms of how we think, how we ask questions and how we try to answer them. So thank you for all that. So um, I will try to communicate the questions that are being raised. Uh, that, um, um, um, we already had a couple of them. And uh, I would like to start with the question by Hasan Güçlü. Um, who says um, uh, he's curious on what level, uh, on which level of your multi-scale models you had the most difficulty in obtaining the data needed? Is it human behavior data, social contacts data, disease uh, biological data, or something else? Uh, first of all, uh, hi, hello, Hassan. Uh, we we uh, uh, and and and. I would say, unfortunately, uh, all levels are a challenge. <laughs> uh, biological data uh, is for sure, especially at the early stage of an epidemic are, are a problem, you know, uh, it takes time. As you see, for instance, now with the Omicron variant, we would all like to have uh, biological data about the transmissibility, what is that it's, there is a shorter incubation time, uh, what is the transmissibility, how much evasion from the vaccine, it takes time. It would be great to have real time. But this is, there are some, how to say, basic constraints to that. Uh, then there is a lot of uh, issues with respect to behavioral uh, data of the population. This is something that, you know, as you can imagine, we live uh, a world uh, in which we are all connected uh, digitally and uh, uh, digital data providers have plenty of data of uh, where we go, what, what we do, et cetera, that could be shared. And for many, many years, we asked those actors to set up systems that in a privacy preserving way were able to communicate those data in a pipeline to who does modeling for emergencies. Well, uh, it was not ready, unfortunately, at the early stage of the pandemic. So there was a lot of building during the pandemic. We have learned how to do. Now the problem is that is also rightly so. Those uh, uh, providers and companies, et cetera, they are saying, well, you know, we cannot keep doing that forever. <laughs> this has to be institutionalized somehow. And here again is where we will hit the bottom, uh, the, the, the, the, the, the problem at a certain point to get funding to make these things uh, institutional. You know, it's like for the weather forecast. You know, we have sent satellite in orbit. Yes, there is a cost about that. But, you know, you can't imagine that this is done only when there is the epidemic and then we have to reinvent the wheel every time. And so that's that's another major uh, uh, major issue. Then there are the data concerning, uh, you were talking about transparency, et cetera. Data about cases, people hospitalized. Well, this is, has been a huge challenge. We all thought of a pandemic that we would handle by having, uh, you know, these wonderful data centers with the multiple screens, everything digital, etc. We have been working for months and months, and even now with spreadsheet, <laughs> you know, that are filled by hand and by people in hospitals, because yet in the entire world we don't have yet uh, capacity to set up systems uh, you know that in a privacy preserving way can send in real time data about about uh, uh, hospitalization deaths and, and so on and so forth and that has been a, a major issue even now you know 
the signal that you see in terms of deaths, cases, etc., is completely the noise is due to the reporting delays, backfilling problems still after the two years present on the ground. And I think there is a lot, a lot to do. Thank you. Um, um, another question, oh, maybe, um, uh, yeah, another question comes from Onurvaro. Uh, in addition to all the challenges of modeling spread of a virus, now there is also a concern about infodemic and misinformation about vaccines. People have different attitudes about getting vaccinated. What could be done to take different vaccine related beliefs into account? Well, let me be really honest. Uh, I've been asked, uh, I, I don't remember in what occasions, uh, what occasion, but what, what was the, the, the, the largest surprise to me during this pandemic? The things that really initially I didn't think about it. Well, for me is what, what, what happened with vaccine and vaccine hesitancy has been one of the most surprising thing. So I always thought, okay, when the vaccine will be available, we will be all rushing to get vaccinated, et cetera. And now the fact that in half of the world, we are struggling you know, to get people vaccinated, <laughs> it's, it's for me is unconceivable. And at the same time, you know, there are issues related to the fact that we have vaccine that is sitting and used. And, and you know, we can go into those discussion uh, uh, at large. Misinformation has been one of the major key in this process. And unfortunately, you know, misinformation is another social contagion phenomena. It's like an epidemic, so yes, it's an infodemic. And uh, unfortunately, social contagion is much more complex than, than biological contagion. It's uh, indeed is what we call non-linear, uh, you know, to the, to the end, because it's not just the non-linearities that we see in the biology, but there are the non-linearity of our way of interacting. You know, if you hear uh, uh, somebody who is your friend, uh, it's different than if you hear somebody on the street, if you hear from the media, there are bubbles, echo chambers, all these kinds of things that are making uh, uh, infodemics extremely complex. I think we need to do a lot of uh, work there. We need to understand. At the same time, I think, uh, we need to, to communicate better. I think what you were mentioning uh, uh, kind of before in terms of scientific, as scientists, as scientific societies, as academies, is to really step up our, our game in terms of communication, not just during a pandemic, but really science to the world. And, uh, and also for me, one of the most depressing things, I don't know if it happened in Turkey, was at a certain point to see student uh, scientists A fighting versus scientists B on, on, on the media or on television in getting in conflicts and things that are completely, this is not science. Science is something different. Something is a collective process in which uh, you know the facts emerge from the interaction of the scientists, but not from you know trying to advocate your own reasons and say I'm right, I'm wrong, etc. If we are not able to communicate that, is a big problem. And another thing is that we didn't communicate and participate to the infodemics, to the to the misinformation, is that we communicated too much, a kind of cliche of science mm -hmm. in which we have the old, generally is an old scientist with a long bird, something like that, that is alone is in his office. And finally, Eureka, he has the discovery that is the reality. And that reality is infallible. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the truth. No, we have to teach people that science is a trial and error process. And that in a situation like an emergency, we learn, we, we, we have a path of learning. We can be wrong at certain point. People was disoriented by this thinking, okay, science is telling something. And then after six months has changed the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, how to say the mitigations or the, the, the, the, the, the, the, uh, the directions to the, to the population. No, we need to have people that is 
that knows what is a scientific process. And we need to do a much better work there, really. It's, it's our duty, especially as a, an academy, as, as a scientific organization, as a society. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, so, Mesut Arzurumlu also asks, uh, can you comment on which countries' governments you think took good and timely decisions given their respective circumstances? And maybe I might kind of couple my question with that. Um, is it uh, possible uh, using your methodologies or to what degree is it possible to trace uh, where the data was being manipulated more uh, because you st studied the different countries? Now you're asking me slippery questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one of them came, so I just had to- We can get, we can, we can take this offline perhaps. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, let me take this, uh, how to say, from the <laughs> evading uh, at least partially this. Uh, uh, let's first of all give uh, a free pass to everybody in February, March, 2020. You know, that was a moment that I, I always told, I was going into, into meetings and I was telling in uh, perhaps in February or, or very early March, look, this is going to be a major problem, et cetera. And I'm always saying, okay, the people were asking me, do you have, you know, when you have a hurricane, you have always a picture of the hurricane. No, you have the satellite that is showing that. And people was asking something like that. Do you have a picture of the hurricane? And you say, well, no, you know, for an epidemic is different. You don't have a picture, you don't have a photo. You, you have models that are telling you something. But... And so all the discussion, I, I thought it was very, very difficult. Then from there, actually, I was surprised by the fact that we are going through the same cycle every, every six months. And, and, you know, it seems that you have to repeat all the discussion that you had, uh, you know, in February and then in, in October and then in the spring and over and over again. Uh, data, uh, for sure, not in many places do not reflect the actual reality. Uh, there are ways to, uh, to check uh, in terms of uh, comparing excess debt with respect to reported cases uh, to number of cases, uh, et cetera, where the inconsistencies are. In many cases, inconsistencies are not, however, I don't wanna get into the fact that there were, how to say, uh, manipulation of data. In many cases, data were really just not collected there. There was no infrastructure and there were a lot of problems in collecting those data. Most of the countries, all of the countries, according to estimate that we, we do in many different ways, are underreporting everything. <laughs> you know, you just don't, don't you underreport. For countries like, uh, like yours, like Europe, US, this underreporting is much less. For certain countries, as you can imagine, the underreporting is, is, is, is really huge. Um, so you really need to see where, where things are. I don't wanna say that, that, that you know, uh, there is always man manipulation, although in some places at a certain point, probably uh, we had example of, uh, of that. The question to say who did good and who did wrong, it's very, very difficult because it depends on the level of preparation, the level of resources. Some countries did, uh, didn't perform good, but they really could, they were not in a position to perform well. Some other countries that were in a position to perform well, they didn't perform well because of delays, because of uh, uh, bad policy making. But in some cases also because although they were in a, in a good place, for instance, as an health infrastructure or communication, infrastructure, they didn't have set up a system to do the appropriate contact tracing, et cetera. For sure, some of the countries in uh, like Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, they were very well prepared. They had the scars of uh, SARS in 2002 and they were very well prepared. And so they had immediately boots on the ground they did 
fantastic work with contact tracing. The population was very, uh, how to say, uh, the, the adherence to mask mandates, et cetera, was, uh, was exemplary. So, you know, there were many, many different things. I don't wanna, however, list, uh, oh, these are the good countries and these are the bad countries also because in some cases the position has shifted. Somebody who was very good at the beginning suddenly started to mess up things in the second phase and so. You know, and one thing that I really, I'm sorry, I always give a long answer, but there will be probably the next 20 years that we will all, <laughs> all will be focused on that. <laughs> now we are all trying to scramble and, and, and get out of this. And then, you know, there is so much data, so much uh, things accumulated and, and there will be a huge, I would say analysis and uh, and assessment of what what has been done uh, in each place. Believe me, and and there will be a lot a lot to learn and a lot perhaps to uh, to internalize for the next time. I see that you're optimistic uh, in thinking that with the next pandemic, it's gonna be really I... and also. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not that optimistic, you know, I see that the memory that unfortunately uh, politics has such a short memory, you know, and you see immediately this exponential decay of what is the promises of what they will do to science and, you know, in uh, everybody was telling, oh, we will do this and that. Uh, and, and as soon as things are going better, things start to slow down, then, you know, get another exit. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic, uh, but you know, there, there will be a lot of work that will be done anyway on what happened in the past two years, that, that for sure. And, and, and, and hopefully there, uh, how to say, there will be learning uh, to, to, to have, but, but we have to advocate. This is also, you know, I'm talking to, uh, to such important academy in your country. This is our role as scientists uh, to, push for that, to constantly be a reminder that, that you know, we don't need that short-term memory. We need to, to, uh, to keep, uh, when we will be out of this, uh, to, to, to continue uh, to uh, question ourselves, what happened, why, what we did wrong, what we did good. Okay, with that, I take you out of the muddy waters and uh, come to Chan Kaplan's question. What kind of algorithms can be used to optimize certain parameters like transmission rate uh, of the different equations? Well, here you, you go uh, and basically every area of, uh, of, of science is, uh, is welcome. We go from techniques that, that, that goes from uh, uh, MCMC in Monte Carlo, you know, and and uh, and uh, approximate Bayesian computation, uh, um, deep neural networks, uh, uh, whatever you use, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's welcome uh, at this stage. And again, I really resistant to say we want to select a winner. There is no winner. Every every approach as is its own pro and cons, depending on the situation, depending on the kind of data. So it's all hands on deck. And, uh, you know, in our case, we use all of them. We use machine learning that is uh, in the, uh, for instance, to get more information and, and, and fine graining information on, on populations. At the same time, we use uh, uh, machine learning to, to optimize the, the uncertainty. Uh, uh, so, well, let me give you a, just a simple example. A mechanistic model of an epidemic will give you a certain trajectory. Uh, this trajectory has a cone of uncertainty that is given by the stochasticity and your knowledge of parameters. But then on top of this, there is what I was telling you. That's a reported uh, with a delay, generally up to two to three weeks. Uh, there is a backlog. There is a, a, a holiday and the department is closed and they are testing less. You know, there are all those real life things. Well, the models doesn't have that. 
and so it will never include in the in the in the confidence interval those those those uh, those effects. Well, machine learning instead by looking at two years of data can learn about that in a way that is although it's less transparent is very effective, and so produce uh, a, an uncertainty estimate that is better because then you will have to compare with the real data, this, uh, this, this uncertainty and the real data contains those effects. And so you see that uh, uh, all approaches are extremely, extremely important. You don't want just to say, well, I focus on this or focus on that. It's, it's uh, for me really in these endeavors, and, and let me say, in the, as sci scientists, we will face existential challenges in the future, climate, poverty, uh, inequalities well you know we need to stop thinking to these disciplinary things and, and really build these all ends uh, on deck uh, approaches uh, where we all contribute our expertise and then that's that's that's extremely important in my humble opinion what you just last said ties into Altan Kabakchoğlu's question. Uh, the fact that the scientific community has not shown the necessary degree of collaboration, data sharing, etc., was in fact a big disappointment. Um, uh, I wonder, he says, if there's any current organized effort to build an infrastructure to be utilized in future possible pandemics. Well, uh, we... Uh... There are two major efforts at the moment. Uh, one is uh, at the WHO level, where they, the World Health Organization, where they are setting up uh, in uh, in Germany a center for uh, data analytics uh, that should uh, uh, help uh, across the world uh, with all the problems related to data, data analytics, data analytics capacity modeling uh, and so on and so forth. In the United States, we are, we are doing a big effort to build a center for outbreak response, a national center for outbreak response within the CDC, but the CDC didn't have before a modeling and, uh, and uh, analytics uh, uh, center that again will possibly coordinate the, the space of research in academia, uh, industry and, and, and government agencies. I think this should be an effort that is done uh, in each country. I think that most of the countries have the capabilities to do that. I'm sure that in Turkey, I actually I know, there is a lot of expertise in those areas that can, if you start to coordinate them in the appropriate way, and you build the, the communication framework, uh, you unify the language, etc. you can build something that is permanently there. But, you know, again, you don't want people to invent the wheel when there is the emergency. I want to invent the wheel before, and that's an investment. Uh, I, I totally understand when agencies are telling, well, we need this for weather forecast because weather forecast is a day-by-day -day business. Pandemics are one every 100 years. Well, it's not true, unfortunately. Pandemics are not one in 100 years because it, since 2000, we had already SARS, H1N1, Zika, Ebola that is a problem now that is affecting uh, every one of us uh, at different instances, MERS, and now COVID. And then is an issue of what is the impact. And the impact, as we have seen, is so extreme that you know, it's any any way worth an investment. Is any that anyways our insurance for the future? And so I think we should build those efforts all over the places, and we should advocate for all eff those efforts all over the places. For sure, my dream is to have something where, like we have for for for for extreme weather, in which we have national agencies, and then we have super national agencies and a lot of communication. So, but this is something that where we hope to, to, to advocate and, and be able to push for that. It will not be, uh, be easy. All right. Um, so- Can I, oh, just I one, one of thing. Yeah, for those international efforts, please let me tell you, there is a big, huge need to provide capacity to low and middle income countries. 
they do not have in many cases the capacity. We need to provide them capacity. We need to provide them infrastructure. If you are a generous person because you are generous, if just because you are selfish, because you are selfish, because it's the best way anyway to protect yourself. So we need to think globally, you know, think locally. It's not going to cut, <laughs> to make the cut for a pandemic or for emerging health trends. And so that is so important. We are seeing also now with vaccine distributions. Now, one of the problem with the vaccine is not just, uh, you probably read a, a lot of times, oh, the doses, the doses, it's not the doses. Is the infrastructure to distribute, to put the doses in the arms of people. And these are cost much more and they have to be built before, they have to be in place before. We cannot forget that. So the response to a pandemic is something that is global. And unfortunately, we have to take care of all of us. And, and so when we think about those scientific schemes, those centers, those initiatives, let's think global. Excellent. Yes. Actually, we have seen as, you know, in Science Academy, when we partake in, you know, international societies, uh, unfortunately, the um, uh, people who representatives come from Western countries, mostly, who, so the decision processes reflect their expertise. And uh, so uh, that's missing. So I think more scientists should participate uh, from all over the world in these um, academies uh, in the you know in these you know even small it's at the lower level um, i think it makes a difference to convey yeah, i, th I think uh, the, the, the, can I, this process starts with the training with training scientists from those uh, those countries offering them uh, harbor offering them uh, the possibility to train and the possibility to go back to their countries with knowledge that they can use there. This is the first thing. I, I've been working for, for, for many years in an institution that is the International Center for Theoretical Physics uh, that is really uh, made by UNESCO to provide this kind of training and exchange and possibility. This is important. We, cannot, we have to do this an order of magnitude more. We need to have all our uh, societies and academy to do that more. And, and then there is a matter of, of coordination of that and infrastructure to build all, all, all that. But we need really to start from, from all the pillars. We, we cannot forget that. I, I, I, you know, this is, and again, this is a matter, I don't wanna do the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the how to say it, go to the, let's say it's a matter of funding you need to have fun to invite those scientists you need to have you know you need to have to create those exchange programs you need we need to foster that and you know this is also for us because now when we ask uh, oh we see a situation like that in uh, in in, a, in you know this variant is in south africa they have a good scientific a very good actually an outstanding scientific uh, uh, a cadre of scientists there. But let's imagine this happens in many other countries where there is not that, that cadre of scientists. We would know about this variant uh, when is, you know, probably never when he's already creating a havoc uh, in, in our countries. And many times to understand what's going on in these countries, you need to have people there. You cannot say from, you know, from an international center that is in, in, in some uh, European city, you know, so we need to do that. And I know that there is a lot of willing from the WHO, from all these, uh, these, these agencies to do that, but we need support. There is need of support and there is need not to forget Get that this support is, is you know, we will be out of this pandemic. We will, con we need to continue to do that. I'm sorry if I repeat this like, like, like but when Aisha was was mentioning my visit in uh, during the big snow in Istanbul was exactly for an occasion like that. It was the on uh, I think during that H1N1 pandemic. It was, you know, and and we we need to constantly advocate advocating that as a scientist. Otherwise, we we we lose perspective. We think about our own lab, our own activities, but not about what the world needs, and we can forget that. 
Well, Hasan Güçlü had a follow-up question, which I would like to take to you now. Um, um, he's asking, uh, do you think it's doable or should it be done to create a framework or an ensemble to combine different epi epidemiological models uh, to come up with more reliable forecasts like we did in the CDC challenge with influenza? Yeah, we did for COVID in the United States. Now there will be, we have a preprint that is out where you will see is, there are, I think, 350 out or something like that. And, and the, the, the, the journal was a, was a little bit shot initially because uh, they said, what, what, what is that? This is high energy physics or, or and, and indeed it's, <laughs> it's, something, it's something that I'm trying to communicate to, to epidemiology, to, to, to, to my colleagues, because as a physicist, I'm used, you know, well, you, you do a big a high energy experiment, you have hundreds of, of people, you know, actually thousands in some cases. What's the problem? You know, we, we always have, that, have done science like that. So yes, we have, we are building that, uh, this infrastructure in the United States. Uh, there is an effort, a similar effort in, uh, in Europe uh, through the European Center for Disease Control. And we are advocating, uh, I, I, I'm advocating, uh, oh, I, I don't know if it would be successful with uh, with some private foundations to do that uh, uh, worldwide with with uh, uh, low and, and middle income countries. I hope these things will come to fruition in the in, in the future. But for instance, when we try to do that in low and middle income countries, it's a matter of how many people there are able to do that kind of modeling that is needed to create ensemble. And so this is where you start to think about the problem more uh, in really the, the, the, the pillars of it and say, oh, look, I need the training. I need, uh, I need uh, to, you know, I don't want to do in Europe and the US the forecast for them and interface with their agencies. I want the people who is there that is able to, to, to do that and advocate in their countries. And, uh, but there is a lot of move. Uh, a lot of energy now and a lot of momentum for that. I hope again that the politics will not have a short memory. Okay, so um, all things must come to an end and so we're nearing the end. Uh, I would like to uh, share one, uh, I mean, I, I, I met you in 2002 when you came to Kash. There was a summer school there and I was starting out as a scientist in yeah. Turkey. And uh, actually, I found my notes from those days, and I had <laughs> these pages where you know Mespiani, you know, they want me to, and it's like all the basics of whatever you talked about, they were just emerging, but it's all there actually. So that was quite nice to see them. Um, but in passing, I would like to um, uh, give the final word to Aisha Arzan. Um, um, thank you. Uh, Jalan and uh, uh, Alessandro, this was uh, really a tour de force uh, a meeting uh, exposition and uh, truly masterful, uh, truly sensitive, truly uh, oriented towards the world and uh, uh, asking uh, that people really do what they should be doing and uh, joining each other in doing this. I, I, I'm, I'm really so impressed in the way that you have uh, somehow become a sage. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I really like, really <laughs> Thank like. you, Aish. Thank you. Bye-bye.